Hello and welcome to our fourth lecture. And in this lecture we are going to talk about some general principles of bank management. Of course there are a lot of things that are related to managing a bank, however we can categorize those into four main parts of bank management. So firstly liquidity management, then asset management, then liability management, and lastly but not least capital adequacy management. So a word on each of those. Liquidity management is managing the amount of liquidity of course on the bank's balance sheet. That refers to the reserves or basically cash that the bank has. Within the management of liquidity there are a couple of things that banks try to keep their mind on, keep an eye on. Firstly in most countries there are minimum requirements on the amount of reserves that banks have to have which depends on the amount of deposits they have. On the other hand, after the banks have satisfied those minimum requirements on the, on the amount of reserves, they don't want to have too much reserves. They don't want to have too much cash lying around as this unutilized capital is not going to create profitability. Asset management within a bank mostly relates to trying to obtain high interest rates from good borrowers, basically reducing the risks of those loans that the banks provide. Asset management also involves trying to find good marketable securities to buy, which are relatively safe, but at the same time provide good profitable opportunities. So basically asset management is trying to obtain high returns and at the same time trying to reduce the risks. Different kinds of risks including credit risk, interest rate risk and so on. Now liability management. Another word for liability in accounting is sources of funds. So liability management is about trying to obtain sources of relatively cheap funds in order to use those funds in financing purchases of different marketable securities or financing the loans that the banks provide. In the modern world since the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 I would guess that uh, liability management is not that much of a difficult task for banks since the central bank, the Fed and central banks in other countries are always ready to provide loans to commercial banks at a very low interest rates. And capital adequacy management is making sure that the bank doesn't have too little as well as too much capital. According again to banking regulation in many different countries, there is some minimum amount of capital that the banks must have. But on the other hand, again, banks don't want to have too much capital as it reduces the return on equity for the shareholders of the bank. Next let's have a look at some more details of liquidity management. We're going to have a look at a couple of examples that show the importance of having enough liquid assets, importance of having enough reserves for a bank. So let's say we're going to look at a bank which faces the reserve requirement of 10%. That means that on the asset side of its balance sheet the reserves must be at least 10% of the deposits and deposits of course are on the liability side of the balance sheet. In this case let's say we have a bank which has 20 million in reserves and say it has 100 million in deposits. So the minimum amount of reserves that the bank must have is 10 million, 10% of deposits according to the reserve requirement. This bank however has 10 million extra so those are excess reserves. Now let's see what happens to the bank if uh, there is a deposit outflow of let's say 10 million. So basically a lot of depositors just by chance today come to the bank to withdraw a lot of money from the bank. So on the liability side of the balance sheet of course deposits will decrease by that 10 million that the depositors are withdrawing. So the remaining deposits will be 90 million and on the asset side reserves or cash within the bank will reduce by the withdrawn 10 million because 
the depositors that withdraw their money receive that cash from the banker. In this example, even though the bank faced quite a severe deposit outflow, that's 10% of all of the deposits that were withdrawn, the bank is still fine. It still complies with this requirement of 10% for reserves. Deposits are in total 90 million, 10% of that is 9 million. So the required reserves would be 9 million. The bank actually has more than that, so it does comply with the regulation, no problem. However, if we contrast the previous example with this new one, we will see the gist of liability management a little more clearly. Let's look at another example with no excess reserves. Again, the same reserve requirement, 10% of deposits is the minimum amount of reserves that the banks must have. Let's say this bank only maintains that minimum. If the bank faces the same harsh deposit outflow of 10 million, this is what's going to happen to its balance sheet. On the right-hand side, deposits reduce from 100 to 90 million, and on the left-hand side, of course, cash reduces from 10 million to zero, or reserves reduce from 10 million to zero. All of that cash was used to honor the withdrawals. Now this bank is in a troublesome situation. It has no reserves. Reserves are equal to zero, but according to the regulation, it must have at least 9 million in reserves. 9 because now 9 million is 10% of total 90 million in deposits. So the bank must do something quickly to obtain some liquid funds somewhere to obtain reserves. So what can the bank do? It can do four things. It can either borrow from a central bank, from the Fed. Nowadays it's easily done since 2008-2009 central banks in many countries of the world have printed a lot of money and a lot of that money was provided as extremely cheap loans to commercial banks those commercial bank those commercial banks don't have to borrow from the central bank they can borrow from each other or from other corporations as well another thing that banks can do that face this liquidity trouble is they can sell some of their securities, some of their stocks or bonds they're holding in order to raise some cash or they can sell some of their loans basically give away the loan to another bank receive cash in return and whenever the borrowers repay those loans those repayments will also be transferred to that other bank each of these will actually fix that troublesome situation on the balance sheet of the bank. Let's have a look at that quickly. Here the bank is in trouble, no reserves, but the minimum requirement is 9 million for this bank with this amount of deposits. If the bank borrows from another bank, of course, on the, on the right hand side of the balance sheet, on the liabilities side, borrowings increase by 9 million. On the left hand side, reserves or cash increased by that same 9 million. If the bank sells some of its securities, securities used to be 10 million, now they only 1 million as 9 million in securities were sold and some cash, some reserves were raised. All changes are on the left hand side of the balance sheet. If the bank borrow from, borrows from the central bank, again on the right hand side of the balance sheet we see 9 million in discount loans, that's the name for borrowings from the central bank as they're called in US and I think they're simply called central bank loans in many other countries of the world. On the left hand side of the balance sheet of course we see that this cash that was borrowed from the central bank appears as reserves on the left hand side of the balance sheet and lastly if the bank sells some of its loans it used to have 90 million in loans let's say 9 million in loans are sold to another bank and this current bank receives 9 million in cash in return and that cash adds to the reserves within the bank. So there are quite a few ways for a bank to obtain liquid assets, to obtain cash, reserves, in case if it faces liquidity problems. However, all of those ways are costly. Borrowing either from central bank or other banks, corporations, is of course costly. You, costly. you have to pay an interest rate on the borrowing although nowadays interest rate is relatively low. Selling securities might be costly because if you have to sell them before they mature, you might lose on the interest that you 
could have gained otherwise and same for selling loans before they mature. Therefore, to avoid these costs, banks want to balance the amount of liquidity they have uh, versus profitability because, as I said, liquid assets don't create much profits. Instead, when liquid assets are converted into other types of assets, such as marketable securities and different kinds of loans, that's when banks can actually increase their profitability. So we move on into asset management. Basically, the gist of asset management is trying to obtain higher returns and combine that with relatively lower risks of the assets obtained. So that consists of um, basically several actions that the banks can take. Banks try to find good borrowers that are likely to repay the loans and banks will try to charge higher interest rates for those loans. Another thing that banks try to do is, of course, they try to find good securities where the issuers are unlikely to default on those securities. And they're trying to find the securities with relatively lower risk combined with higher returns. Sometimes it's hard to do, but banks might actually have expertise in analyzing different securities, analyzing the issuers and the financial standing of those issuers. Another thing to reduce risks of the assets that you have is, of course, have some diversification, invest into different types of assets instead of putting all the eggs in one basket. And again, as I mentioned, balancing liquidity versus profitability is also part of asset management because liquid assets are just another type of assets. And too much liquidity hurts profitability. Next, let's have a look at liability management the third big component of principles of bank management. And that's basically trying to attract cheap sources of funds. One of the ways to do that is to attract more depositors. In my time, I saw a lot of advertisements where banks were offering to give you some cash if you switch your current account. That's one example of what they could do to attract depositors. Another way to attract cheap sources of funds is simply borrow. Nowadays, interest rates are relatively low or issue new CDs and sell them. And lastly, the fourth component of principles of bank management is managing the amount of capital that the banks have. On one hand, the banks don't want to have too little capital because capital protects against bankruptcy. In addition, there are requirements on the amount of capital that the banks must have. There are minimum requirements on that. But on the other hand, banks don't want to have too much capital as it hurts return on assets. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Let's look at these two banks, one with high amount of capital, that's 10 million, compared to the total assets of 100 million, that's 10% of total assets is in capital, and another bank with only 4% of total assets in capital with the same amount of total assets, 100 million and 4 million in capital. Let's see what happens to the banks if each, let's say, suffer similar losses of, say, 5 million on bad loans, subprime mortgages or stuff like that that we heard about 10 years ago. So the first bank, if it loses 5 million in bad loans, the loan's value decreases from 90 million all the way down to 85 million. On the right-hand side, the capital of the bank will be reduced in the balance sheet from 10 down to 5 million. This bank is still solvent as capital is more than zero. Whereas if the second bank incurs a similar loss of 5 million, loans on the left-hand side of the balance sheet again decrease from 90 million to 85 million. Whereas the amount of capital decreases from 4 million to negative one. So actually this bank becomes insolvent. So this example shows that originally the, the larger amount of capital actually protects the bank from possible bankruptcy just in case if there are some losses that the banks incur. But as I mentioned, there are a couple of other things to keep in mind when talking about capital adequacy management. First of all, there are capital requirements set by the regulators in many countries of the world Capital must be at least some percentage of total assets or often risk-weighted total assets. So the, rest, the less risks 
banks take on on their assets, the less capital they uh, have to maintain according to the requirements. And another thing to keep in mind is that the banks don't want to have too much capital, even though it protects against bankruptcy, because larger capital hurts the return on equity. That basically hurts the profitability for the investors into the bank, the shareholders, the owners of the bank. Let's have a look at this example again, high capital bank. The capital is 10 million of total assets of 100 million. If the bank is lucky enough to make a profit of say 10% of total assets, that's 10 million. That would be 10 million profits on 10 million capital that the bank owners actually supplied into this organization. So that would be 100% earnings for the shareholders of the bank. If instead, for example, bank capital was 50 million instead of 10 million, the same profits of 10 million would only be 20% of the total capital su supplied by the bank owners. So with greater capital, 50 million instead of 10 million, the return on equity would be lower.